talk about recursive neural networks. So RNN stands for recursive neural networks and also uh, recurrent neural networks. Recurrent neural networks you are familiar with in machine translation, everything you do with LSTM and GRU and those things. But recursive neural networks, which is the subject of this playlist, is less, people are less familiar with that because they are less familiar with the beautiful world of computational linguistics and parsing. So in 2010, this great researcher, Christopher Manning and his friends, Andrew Y.N.G. and Richard Socher, they created this uh, syntactic parsing, for, for the syntactic pro parsing problem, they created these recursive neural networks. And later in 2011, they use it for natural scenes as well. And, and, and here they use it for compositional vector grammars. They notice that in order to share those weight vectors for all of the nodes, they can have, they can separate the complexity for, for different categories and so on. So let's focus on this learning continuous phrase representation and syntactic parsing with recursive neural nets in 2010, which is the building blocks of all of our models that we have developed in uh, about recursive neural networks. So, so the idea is like that. We have some constituents. So these are words of the sentence. And then if you add them, we know that in word to vec, each word has an embedding. And now here we can also embed phrases, even larger phrases, even a sentence. And finally, when we, when we reach here, we have, this is the embedding of the, of the sentence. This is the embedding of these uh, of span from X2 to X4 and so on. So we are extending the idea of word to vec to to the sentences. But our motivation is different. We want to create a score because if we have a score, we can compare it with the score of the tree bank. Because we have the tree bank, we can create the loss. So the main idea is that we, have, we create a vector. At each node, we have a vector P. So we concatenate for example, C1 and C2, that here is X3 and X4, we concatenate, it multiplied with a vector W, weight W and plus the bias, and then we have an activation tangent 10H. And so we have a vector P, if you just dot product it with W score, we get a scholar. That scholar is called our score. So if you do it for each nose of the tree, then we have we have the nodes of uh, we have the score of each tr all of these uh, all of these nodes and then if you add all of them we get the score of a tree so christopher manning very beautifully separated these uh, models first he said we only say we have greedy it, it means as, as long as we get the score we say which one matches together we don't care about uh, later future what happens as long as we have two things have great um, score they they combine to each other like like two atoms that combine to each other becomes a molecule and larger molecules and so on so in the second model, he adds context sensitive. It means that we also include the surroundings of that, your surrounding words of that, so that it has better expressive power. So you get the score as usual. And the third model, he also introduced category classifier because that is another source of expressiveness and it reduces the loss even more significantly. And the last model, which is really beautiful, is the global. It says that you should not greedily work in this world. You should see the global graph and see how it, all of these constituents relate to each other. But the, at the global picture, it has a big score. And so these are training, word, training sentences uh, XI is our sentence, training sentence I. Training sentence I has a tree, which is called YI. So this is a tree. 
And for each of these, uh, we have we predicted. So, so if you have a score of this sentence, we can also predict it for that sentence. But why is over all of the trees, as I said in my playlist for syntactic parsing, we have ambiguities in natural language. That's why I have lots of trees. And we, if you maximize over all of them, uh, all of these sum, then uh, it should be uh, almost the same as this. It, the gap should be reduced. So the idea is like support vector machine. You have lots of nodes here for one class. We have another class here. We want a line, a hyperplane to separate these things, and but you want to be robust. It means that this margin, this M, to be as much as possible. Here is the same. This delta plays that margin. It means that if there is a mismatch between prediction and this uh, gold answer, that mismatch should be compensated, compensated uh, by by delta. It means it should be the errors that create, not uh, not just f furious, not just something um, mysterious. Everything should be, uh, should be, I mean, all of these uh, blames <clears throat> should be considered by this delta, and uh, we should blame delta for this mismatch, and nothing else. So it it, it creates a robust approach. And so uh, the global approach, as I said, um, like, like, like previous methods, we, we just add for all of the nodes in order to create the score of that sentence, xi, uh, for the tree yi. And then, so if you add the score of all nodes, you get the score of a tree. And delta is just a mismatch because... Uh, if if D is in your tree, you add it. But if it is if it not if it is if it is if it is different from the goal answer, you, it is it's a problem. Is you add all of these mistakes. So this is just a summation of all of the mistakes that you you may uh, make. And uh, in so we do error back propagation as well. Uh, here we have, uh, here we have, you know, in classical machine learning, we are just talking about backpropagation because we have a skull, we have just uh, one versus another, X versus Y. But here we have different things. We have, uh, we have a tree. So that's why in the literature it is called structure prediction. It means that all of these nodes uh, they contribute to the overall score to the overall uh, uh, objective function. That's why you we, we should generalize the idea of this backpropagation to backpropagate to, to the weights of these nodes of the uh, these weights of all of these nodes. And we have done it here. Uh, if you watch my playlist and, and optimization methods, I explain all of these subgrading methods, this continuous optimization and so on. So my playlist in YouTube uh, is, like a, is like a graph, graph of dependencies. For example, I have, in, two years ago, I created some playlist about basic computer science. Even even basic mathematics like optimization, multi-objective optimization, approximation algorithms, and uh, graph theory, algorithm in graphs, and so on. And 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 then I built some intermediate layers, like machine learning ideas, how how they can be combined together. And and later, I created about. Uh, those uh, natural language playlists, and I combined them uh, with, uh, uh, cr I created even more, more applied things like dialogue systems, dialogue systems, which is on top of uh, layers like, for example, this is semantic parsing layer, this is constituency parsing layer. So, so it's a dependencies, my, my, 
uh, in future I will have 1,000 lectures, but all of them have weak dependencies with each other so that you start as a beginner at these very primary um, terminal nodes and gradually you learn intermediate ideas and finally you get the whole picture of machine learning and computer science. So now that we have created this course we, and we have created the, we know what tree is the, uh, we have predicted the tree, we will see that, as I said, each node has a vector embedding. Each node is an embedding of that phrase. So in this, in this space, for example, here, this sentence, this, this is the embedding of this sentence, but it has nearest neighbors. So these points are, thus, are, are just nearest points that they are nearest sentences. So if, it, if this is the center sentence, then all of these are just these points around this uh, center node. So there should be, we, we anticipate that there are semantically very similar ideas, very similar sentences. If you read these sentences, they are very similar to this uh, center phrase. And so you should also learn this beautiful, very old uh, article about max margin loss. And... Uh, also, uh, you should know subgradient method for non-differentiable loss because max margin and all of those things. In order to Im improve these uh, models and loss uh, functions, you should be familiar with these subgradient methods. And also, if you combine the probabilistic context-free grammar, by the way, you can watch my playlist for probabilistic context-free grammar. And this is my new playlist, Recursive Neural Nets. If you combine them, uh, uh, you can then read this article, parsing with compositional vector grammar. And so before ending, I want to say that uh, in machine learning, um, people created those, uh, people created those curse of dimensionality problems uh, because because as human we we invent things but after invention for example we invent a car and after inventing that car we say oh this invention creates sound pollution and makes many people cre create they create many diseases and those things so after creation we want to solve the problem but it's good to, before, before inventing a car that creates sound pollution, those things, we should see how can we reduce the noise as much as possible. Or even we design something that doesn't have a noise, doesn't bother, doesn't create lots of mental diseases in our civilization and planet Earth. So that's very important. We should be responsible on this planet. We shouldn't just invent a car and sell it just for business. Money is not everything. We should uh, be responsible and create a car that has less sound pollution. You know, my ears are very sensitive. That's why I hear everything from 200 meters, 300 meters. I, I, I hear all the vibration and all of, all of those things. So I touch this problem more than other people on this planet. But this is just one of the problems. And uh, it has created lots of uh, problems for people. And the same idea is for curse of dimensionality. You know, the gap between mathematicians and uh, computer scientists is big. Because in mathematics, in harmonic analysis, they created wavelet transform, Fourier transform, and all of those things to reduce the dimensionality of the problem, to reduce the uh, uh, information entropy, to control the information entropy, let's say. But in computer science, we just uh, used to concatenate vectors, 
of that PyTorch function and we say okay no problem if we concatenate these we don't care about the length of the vector and the com because if you go to the high dimensional world you have it is uh, it is data hungry you need lots of data to give to that high dimensional model do you have really that big even if you have that much data uh, still your your model is not good because you need even more than that. That's why it's a really big problem that uh, machine learning community doesn't care about these concatenations and they just, uh, they just create new models. But we should be responsible that all of the, we can, we can have better models if we just care about the uh, dimensionality of that. And uh, so, so a simple model a simple model that just uses part of speech because its representation is easier. Representation needs fewer dimension for your vector. It's much better than those uh, very high dimensional uh, word embeddings uh, that even training that is not as fast as uh, simple ideas. So, so um, the curse of dimensionality is handled in uh, in 100 years ago. Why? Because they work on wavelets. Even before that, even, even 200 years ago, uh, with the work of Banach and Hilbert, Banach and Hilbert, and may, may we have many function spaces, many, many other Sobolev spaces and all of those things. The goal of them we should realize it that the go their goal was to reduce the ambiguity the complexity and the information entropy of all of these infinite dimensional functions so their space is even bigger than us because they are talking about infinite dimensional vectors so you may say that their problems is harder. How can they solve this problem? Well, we say they create some bases. If you know the bases of your, for example, in Hilbert space, you have a basis. But even in Banach space, you don't even need a basis. But the, the, I mean, the, the axioms that you play can reduce this dimensionality. Or even in harmonic analysis, they created that they say these wavelet bases are enough. You just need the combination of all of them. For example, if you do wavelet scattering, if you do wavelet scattering, that that is much better than convolutions because you know what you're doing, and it is. Uh, 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 if you transform your picture or anything, still it is invariant. So it encodes all of those things. So, so you don't need to uh, uh, to to invent new to to use lots of neurons, thousands of neurons, just to make invariant uh, transformations. Just to make transformations to be invariant. Uh, so, so in wavelet transform, that's why uh, it's very natural. We are saying, and in in uh, in um, machine learning, we can create new ideas as well. For example, if you remember the concept of attention, you have you have a context. What is a context? Context is a weighted combination of those hidden uh, hidden uh, states. So. I don't say that this is a good basis because still at J is a vector, high dimensional vector. And, but you can think about these ideas and uh, we, can, we can work on the building blocks of machine learning. Co going back to 20 years ago or even 50 years ago to, to, to work from there and see how we can, uh, how we can create models that needs less that creates a, a less cursive dimensionality